welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Today, we bring you Bookshelf, an episode dedicated to the books we're each reading outside of Book Club, the ones we get to pick and choose. And so, coming up, I've been reading literary thriller The Witch Elm by Tana French, the heartbreaking yet often hilarious Hearts Invisible Furies by John Boyne, and the best-selling Secret Commonwealth, which is book two in Philip Pullman's New Book of Dust series. And I've recently been stretching out of my reading comfort zone with Love by Norwegian writer Hanna Ostervik, expanding my knowledge of Russian literature with the Anna Karenina fix by Viv Groskop, and cozying up with hilarious countryside classic Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons. Keep listening to hear what we thought of them and whether there might be any gems in here for your next book club pick. All that coming up here on the Book Club Review. Where to begin? It's so nice to see you. I feel like I haven't seen you for a little while, and I'm just genuinely really excited to hear about all the things you've been reading. <laughs> well, especially because I am without child. Yeah. <laughs> I'm without a baby, so uh, possibly a bit more relaxed. I want to start with Philip Pullman's Secret Commonwealth. Oh, okay. I just want to get it over with. I read the first book in this new mm. sequel, prequel series with yeah. much trepidation because I, like millions of people really loved the dark materials trilogy right i was gonna say which i have read multiple times and it is as good as i remember it being each time i reread it i felt happy to be back in that world and i thought he can still evoke that world really brilliantly and convincingly and i liked the characters you know he's brilliant at characters you just immediately kind of connect with the people that he creates on the page and the story is rich and propulsive it kind of pushes you through, keeps you turning the pages. But there were just things about it that really troubled me. I thought it was too dark for potentially, I thought, the audience that was going to be reading it. And I don't know, I I just had that kind of slight feeling of disappointment, I suppose, and feeling like he should have just left it where he left it with those last three books. Yeah, I do tend to agree. Same, same with the first book. Although I much preferred the first half of the first book, which is the prequel, which is about how Lyra ends up with the alethiometer. She only features as a small wee baby. Um, In the next one, in book two, we've leapt forward to after the Dark Materials trilogy and Lyra is a student at Oxford and she's 20, 21 maybe. And I was really excited to read it. I thought it was going to be like comfort food Mm. and actually it's even bleaker in tone than the first one Mm. lyra and her demon pan or pantalaimon who's kind of her other half who's her soul right you know they are one in the same entity even though they are two distinct they're alienated from each other so actually it's just this really sad state of affairs throughout the entire course of the book because these two halves are at war with one another and actually are physically separate from one another having their own adventures or misadventures and you had said in the first book that you really struggled with the attempted rape which I had actually forgotten yes I felt that there was um the child Malcolm he sees something going on and you see it from his point of view and so it's not totally crystal clear what's happening but it seemed very dark and very troubling and not something I well, felt I'm... comfortable reading or or the idea of a child witnessing that and I wonder if I read that in the first book and was just a bit oblivious, you know, maybe in a different mindset. But they make it very explicit in the second book that that's what was happening. And then after you'd kind of, we'd had an early conversation about this, I was just sort of thinking about that age appropriate question. And in this one, there's a really graphic sexual assault of Lyra by a band of traveling soldiers on a train and she's physically battered, you know, and she fights back and it's just grim and so the tone of this book is a bit off and you just think I kind of wondered if Pullman's just sort of lost the plot like I wondered I wondered if he's trying to overcompensate maybe because quite possibly a young woman traveling alone in these slightly murky I never quite know what time period it's supposed to be I mean it's a different world than ours but is it like 1920s yeah it's kind of alternate universe isn't it so she might be vulnerable to assault of course but it's almost like Pullman's trying to overcompensate and show woman's experience but in a genre or in a book where it just feels a bit full on there were some interesting reviews i saw on amazon which kind of caught my attention i think one of the things that people were struggling with is that 
those Lyra books, the Dark Materials trilogy, are so beloved by so many people. You know, people have named their children Lyra because they love that character so much. I know a Lyra, actually. And imagine that. Imagine you just love these books so much and that character meant so much to you. And then here comes Pullman with this, you know, maybe he feels like he's really pushing creative boundaries maybe obviously writers they have to kind of move forward and explore you can't just accept them to write the same thing again and again and again but it was almost like there was a kind of responsibility there I suppose that maybe he can't really understand or factor in and so people writing these reviews they're just devastated (laughs) the story is a nonsensical mishmash of odd encounters and ideas with no substantive overarching gripping plot very few likeable or even very believable characters adult versions of formerly child characters now dull stereotypes what can only be described as gratuitous use of threat of and actual sexual violence was as insensitively written as it was irrelevant and unjustified in narrative narrative terms whilst being extraordinarily distressing to the reader and along with a feeling that the author arbitrarily and morbidly wished to focus on sinister threats the context and subsequent narrative came off as being both misogynistic and culturally offensive or racist etc that was jj9k reviewed uh, on Amazon. Um, But, you know, he began by saying, my wife and I both loved his dark materials and consider it one of our absolute favourite stories ever. Our daughter is named Lyra after the protagonist of that series and this new novel. Well, he sums it up perfectly, I think. He's picked up on everything that bothered me. You know, he says an odd series of encounters and events. I was texting with a friend about how there's too many quests and she's like yeah there's so many side quests like it's supposed to be a journey into the Levant she's going to find out why all these roses are being destroyed and the knock-on effects and it has something to do with dust it's all a bit confusing I was confused but along the way it's just one side quest after another so you're just like oh why are we doing this now oh you're doing this now and then meanwhile our protagonist from the first book Malcolm Polstead Dr. Malcolm Polstead now Mm. is randomly in love with Lyra Mm. but for no reason And he's 11 years older than her. And you don't know why he's in love with her because you're just told this. Mm. And they've had a sort of falling out and are uncomfortable in each other's presence. But as the book progresses, Lyra is like, oh, maybe I love him, even though they've spent no time together. So it's very, very odd. Mm. That review ended. I'm returning the hardback copy for a refund. We do not want a keepsake of this horrific failure. In fact, I am seeing a hypnotherapist to see if the memory of it could be substantively repressed. Is he joking? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Jenny Allen, who's Australian, wrote, After finishing the last book with Lyra with a baby, it was a bit of a shock to have fast-forwarded some two decades until well after the end of the original trilogy. Lyra has settled into being a slightly petulant scholar and is bickering constantly with her demon. World events move on, though, with new supervillains emerging in emerging police state. The plot doesn't leap forward, it meanders a bit, with a whole lot of new characters some of whom settle in but many of whom just pass by and it ends on a cliffhanger there are interesting threads around power and around the importance of imagination but it didn't seem as well paced or engaging as the earlier books but to be fair for all the negative reviews there were also reviews on there that were positive i think people felt that it was almost like a placeholding book leading you to the third book where everything's going to be tied up i think people were making allowances for that and there were some people who loved it i will probably read the next book because even when he's annoying me and I'm not really liking it, his writing is so good. It's so simple, but you just want to keep going no matter what. Mm. But it would not be a good book club book. My disenchantment with Philip Pullman set in when we did The Good Man Jesus and the Scoundrel Christ for our that. book club a long time ago, which was just dreadful. It was such a terrible book. And we had a great time discussing it, but just awful. And at that point, I was like, no, it's not for me. So what have you been reading? I know I'm not supposed to be talking about book club books in Bookshelf, which is supposed to be our outside of book club. (laughs) But I have been actually going to, I've been dipping into a few other book clubs just to see what they're like. And I went to my local bookshop in KC4. I went to their book club and they were reading a book called Love by a Norwegian writer called Hannah Ostavik, who is incredibly successful and well-known in her native Norway and Scandinavia. She's published many books. They've all been bestsellers. She's one of those people where there I think she would be a household name. But her books have only very recently started to be translated into English. I think this one came out last year. This one has been translated into English by Martin Aitken. Does that name ring a bell with you? 
No. Do you remember a little little favourite of mine called Prophets of Eternal Fjord? <laughs> yes, yes. What a, what a book. Another uh, Scandinavian Any of our novel. listeners not familiar with this, I direct you back to the episode on uh, Prophets of Eternal Fjord, which we did for my book club, which was a rip-roaring discussion, mainly because my book club and Laura hated it so much and I loved it so much. But that was also very beautifully translated by Martin Aiken. This is a very short read. It's about a mother and a son. It's set in the far north of Norway. So this place that's cold and dark and it's winter. And it has this incredibly powerful atmosphere that you immediately just kind of get sucked into. You know, this idea of this cold, dark, inhospitable landscape outside, but then these sort of warm, cozy interior spaces it's the evening of the son's birthday he's eight and he's going to be turning nine and he is thinking about his mother and the preparations she must be making for his birthday and the things that she's going to get him his presents and meanwhile she is thinking about going out that night and whether or not she might meet someone there's someone at her work that she's attracted to and she's hoping she might see them and it's told from the two different perspectives so you see the mother's point of view and the son's point of view, almost from paragraph to paragraph in a way that sounds like it would be annoying, but actually isn't. It's just beautifully done. And it's also entirely written in the present tense. So it's interesting, your sense of time as you read this, because you're always in the moment. And there's something really magical about the way that she does that. It's really unexpected, not quite like anything I've ever read has some beautiful ideas in it which she holds up and examines which are to do with relationships and what people want out of life and how disconnected we can be from people even when we're very very close to them the boy's thoughts are all about his mother he thinks about her almost all the time and she almost never thinks about him so it's an interesting it almost seems the opposite of what you would expect yeah very much so very much so and it's interesting look at motherhood She's strangely cold and disconnected from this boy. And and that led to some interesting discussion, you know, whether people felt that that was realistic, whether we believe that a mother could feel that way about her son. She does meet someone that night, so then she ends up going off with him. And meanwhile, the boy goes out into the night and ends up having his own encounters with people. And the two stories go in parallel. It's mesmerizing. Is it bleak? Is it disturbing as it progresses? What there is, is this constant atmosphere of dread For example, the boy goes out to sell raffle tickets to raise money for his football team. And he goes to a neighbor's house and the neighbor is an old man and the old man invites him in. And, you know, he's only eight. And then the old man invites him down to the basement. And already you're like, "Mm, should you be going down to the basement? And then as he goes down to the basement with the old man, on the wall, there is this kind of iron chain with a kind of gauntlet thing, which the boy sees. And you just like, what, what, what is that? And you're thinking, oh my goodness, something awful is going to happen. But in fact, the old man just wants to show him these ice skates because back in his youth, he was an ice skating champion. And she does that time and time again. She sort of sets up this threat and you just think, oh no, but actually it's not what you think. And then she plays with those expectations in a really interesting way towards the end. The other thing that was really interesting about this book is there are two different ways of interpreting the ending. It's almost like a kind of quite a negative way, which I certainly saw it that way. But then there were other people in the book club who kind of hadn't seen that possibility and were really surprised that some of us had seen this very dark ending. And I thought that was really interesting. It's almost like it tells you something about yourself, the way that you end up interpreting the book. Mm, It sounds good. It was really good. Really, really good. I really recommend it. There was a lovely review by Justine Jordan in The Guardian, and there's a nice quote on the back cover. She says, Ostevic builds a cinematic sense of dread out of the plainest prose, phrase layered on phrase with the hushed implacability of falling snow. And it's a bit like that. It's just beautifully written. And then your other two books are very different. Actually, you've got quite a lot of variation in what you've been reading. (laughs) Well, so my next one was a really lovely surprise. It was a Christmas present from Amanda, who is in my book club and has appeared on this podcast in the past. She gave me a book called The Anna Karenina Fix by Viv Groskop, Life Lessons from Russian Literature. I didn't know anything about it. I'd never heard of Viv Groskop. Then, hilariously, I kept mentioning her to people and everyone I mentioned her to, she'd be, oh yeah, yeah, I know her, yeah. Because she writes for The Guardian. I looked her up and she's sort of a comedian, author, public speaker. She sort of seems to do all these things. Yeah, so I was just the last person to hear about her, really. The answers to some of life's biggest questions are found not in trite self-help manuals, but in the tough love lessons explored in Russian literature. 
Here, Viv Groskop delves into the novels of history's deepest thinkers to discover enduring truths about how we should live. It's almost like quite school of life, Alain de Botany. You know? But then I love all that. So that was, I was... <laughs> <laughs> that was a book for you. It was, that appeals to me. Each chapter starts with a little kind of epigraph, is it? When it's a little thing at the beginning. How to know who you really are, Anna Karenina, or brackets, don't throw yourself under a train. How to face up to whatever life throws at you, Dr. Zhivago with Boris Pasternak, uh, or don't leave your wife while she's pregnant. So is it, it funny? It is funny. How to Keep Going When Things Go Wrong, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich by Alexander Solyanitsyn. Uh, or Don't Forget to Take Your Spoon to Prison With You. We've had that book recommended as a book club read on this show. Have we? Yeah, Andy came and recommended oh, it. Oh, gosh. And that's a story of one day in this man's life in the gulag, you know, sort of awful. So I just, <laughs> I like the idea of taking this as life lessons that, you know, no matter how bad things are, they couldn't be worse mm-hmm. than that. I think what's brilliant about it is how well she knows her subject which is just really pleasing and delightful. She studied Russian at Cambridge. She then went to live in Russia. She was not only a student, but she was also incredibly passionate and enthusiastic about her subject. She believed that somewhere back in her family history, they were Russian. She was sure that she had Russian ancestors. And in fact, in the course of the book, there's a little bit of a kind of mystery about this background where she actually finds out it's not quite what she expected. So she has this sort of reason why she wants to go there and immerse herself. And I think that's really interesting, following someone's interest and passion for another country and another culture. And then the analysis of the books is just really delightful, whether it was ones that I was familiar with. We read War and Peace quite recently, but I've also been to see many a Chekhov play in my time, went through a kind of Russian literature phase in my 20s, I suppose. So that's when I read Anna Karenina and Turgenev and... The ones I had read, it was really nice to have almost like a refresher of them and remember them. The writers themselves are as much characters as the books that they wrote and then she kind of is looking at. And so you get to know them and their differences. And that's really interesting as well, because some of them are just real characters. They're hilarious. It was just a really great read that it's one of those lovely things where you read it and then you sort of want to go off and read more, you know, in the best mm. way. And, you know, sometimes you read a nonfiction and you finish it and you find yourself pouring through the end notes because you just can't quite bear to leave that world. And this is one of those, you know, I read the end notes really carefully because I was really interested in all the little references and, and the source material. And yeah, there's some ideas for things that you might want to go off and read if you want to read more. And would it be a good book club book? I think it would be a great book club book. But what if you've never read much Russian literature? Well, I think that would matter. That's the thing, because I think what's clever about it is it works on every level. So if you didn't know anything about Russian literature, this would be a great way of getting you interested. If you, like me, have a kind of vague passing familiarity with it, but you're someone who loves reading and loves books, you know, these are the great stories. You know, these books are a part of our literary canon, you know, as much as Russia's. And it's nice to know more about them. And then I think if you're someone who really is deeply immersed in that world, I think you'd find this very pleasing because it's written by someone who has a high level of knowledge and expertise, or it certainly seemed like that. The other thing that's quite nice is that there's a bit of her personal story in there, which very much feels like it fits into this kind of current fashion for confessional memoirs. She never goes too far with it, which I liked. It's not kind of everything bad. These brilliant things happen to me. These terrible things happen to me. And this is what I made of my life. It's not that. But there are just enough touches there of her own experiences and what these books meant to her and almost like the life lessons that she learned on the way that kept me really interested and kept me kind of wanting to read it through. So yeah, it was just a really lovely surprise that I would recommend to anyone. Great. Yeah. I recommend it to you. (laughs) I could take it with me as I (laughs) do. For no considered reason, I have been reading a lot of Irish books at the moment. And both the books I'm going to discuss today were either given or loaned to me. The first is Tana French, The Witch Elm. This copy I have in front of me is the North American edition. So it is spelled The Witch Elm, which W-I-T-C-H. However, the British, Irish edition, um, which is W-Y-C-H. I just like that because if our listeners are in different parts of the world, they might find it difficult to spot this book um, on Amazon. I did. I mean, weirdly. Um, My dad brought it for me when he came over to meet his new granddaughter. And we then immediately lost it. Mm. Um, And my dad kept being, he was was at home in Vancouver by this point, but he kept being like, well, have you found the book? And I was like, (laughs) no. He's like, well, what have you done with it? I was like, I don't know. Like, maybe it went out in the recycling. I just don't know. But I did eventually find it. My husband, I think, in a cleaning 
moment had stuffed it with random things in the bottom of our wardrobe. I mean, that's not where books go. (laughs) Um, This was the perfect book, I think, to read as a new mother because it was gripping enough to kind of suck me in and and kind of out out of the ever present thinking about my my daughter and what she's doing into a much more suspenseful story. I've never read her, but my my impression of her is that she writes clever literary thrillers. Well, I have never even heard of her, but yes, I think that is right. I also think that if she wasn't known as a thriller writer, this book would have had a lot more critical attention. I mean, it has had a lot of acclaim. Um, the New York Times made it 100 notable books of 2018. It was a New York Times bestseller. A best book of 2018 by Boston Globe, Lit Hub, Vulture, Slate, L. But, you know, these are quite, this is quite a commercial endorsement. And I think that's fair. It's not high brow literature per se, but it's fantastic. So brief overview of the plot. Our protagonist is Toby. He is our narrator as well. And so we know that something has happened to him and he's recounting from the very beginning which is that he's out for a night on the town with his friends he walks home you're not sure what's going to happen and when he's in his flat after he's fallen asleep burglars break in and he goes out to confront them and rather than them fleeing they kick the crap out of him and he is left unconscious somehow manages to get out of his flat to his neighbor's door he then wakes up in hospital and he is not the same man that he was before he was a golden boy before he's in his late 20s he worked in pr super charming charismatic good looking wealthy family right accent had everything going for him and now he has memory loss he has brain damage one of his legs isn't working properly he slurs his speech when he talks too quickly and he has ptsd from from this attack now He's kind of just hiding in his flat after these events when his cousin calls him up and says, Hugo, their uncle, he's he's dying. You need to go live with him. And Toby doesn't want to do this, but Hugo lives in the family's home, kind of the, it's not even an ancestral home. It is in Dublin. It's in like an affluent suburb of Dublin, but big garden all around it. And these three cousins, Toby, Susanna and Leon, spent every summer there with Hugo. And their parents would go off on holidays and leave them with this uncle and they'd kind of run riot in the back garden. So Susanna says to Toby, you know, you owe it to him. You're not doing anything else. You're not working. Go, go be with Hugo. Now, while he is there and actually at a big family gathering, his nephew comes in and he has discovered a skull in the witch elm, this huge tree in the back garden, and he comes in with it. And then there's a police investigation and it's a it's it's a recent it's a recent skull. I mean, you know, it's this is not a historical skull that's been found and actually there's a whole skeleton in the tree. Mm. Now, because Toby has memory loss, he doesn't know what role he played in this skeleton getting there. This is brilliant. I'm completely hooked. And very quickly it's established that it is the skeleton of a high school friend or acquaintance who spent time at their teenage parties, who everyone thought committed suicide off a cliff and the body was never found, but actually would appear that he's been in that tree Mm, for 10, 10 plus years. And so it goes on from there. Now that's all sort of typical thriller and it has been compared to the secret history. There's definitely parallels. But what I thought was so good about this book and why I think it'd be a really good book club book is Toby's transition from a position of supreme male privilege mm. to a, a fractured, broken man with a physical disability. You know, his brain isn't as sharp as it used to be. He's constantly trying to find the right word. He's trying to hide his disability. His speech is slurred and suddenly he's lost all of that privilege and how he's coming to grips with that. And as we begin to find out what had happened in the past, and we're trying to figure out the mystery of this body being there, it becomes very clear that Toby, from that position, just didn't believe the people in his life who were telling him the terrible things that were happening to them, because he didn't have to almost. Mm. And he is now on the other side. His male cousin was gay and was incredibly bullied at high school. I keep saying high school, you know, that's my Canadian upbringing. His cousin Susanna, we discover, you know, was being well, just had some horrific experiences and won't get too much into that. And he's constantly saying, but why didn't you tell me? And they're like, we did tell you mm. and you just brushed it off. Mm. So there's a lot going on in this book that I think is really, really clever and would give you so much to discuss. Also, just brilliant writing yeah, and sounds fun. super gripping. Mm. A very different Irish book is The Heart's Invisible Furies by John Boyne, which my friend Orla lent to me. And so, so different, but equally delightful in its own ways. Have you read John Boyne before? No, you know, I was thinking, it's one of those titles where I sort of feel like 
there's a sort of series of books with these sorts of titles. I was thinking, you know, there's All the Light, We Cannot See, Anthony Doerr, Do Not Say We Have Nothing, Valentine. There was a kind of little fashion, wasn't there, for books with these kinds of titles, mm. with the result that, because the title is sort of vaguely familiar to me, I sort of feel like I've read it. I've, no, I've never read Joy Boyne. I don't know anything about him, so tell me. Well, tell neither me. did I, but he is famous for his hugely best-selling novel, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Oh, yes. That I have heard of. And I've heard of that too, but I've never read it. Mm. Um, But I think it sold like seven or eight million copies I was reading. Mm. So he's a big deal. I would never have picked up this book because on the cover it says heartbreaking. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, I don't read heartbreaking novels. You don't want to have your heart broken. No, no, I really don't. Um, But my friend Orla lent it to me and I think she said it was one of her favourite books of 2019. And I can see why. So Again, like with The Witch Elm, it's quite a straightforward story. You know, there's this brilliant storytelling going on here. This is the life story of Cyril Avery, although he's not quite an Avery, as he's constantly told by his adopted parents. He's not a real Avery. He gets adopted as an infant by this very eccentric, very wealthy Irish couple who then pay very little attention to his upbringing whatsoever, just kind of benign neglect as they swan about. And it jumps forward from that moment of adoption. And then it's split up into sections where you get a snapshot of his life every seven or eight years moving up until 2015. Now, because Cyril is gay, it then becomes a portrait of what it would have been like to be gay in those years. And just how seismic the changes in attitude have been since that time Mm. in one person's lifespan. Mm. You know, it went from incarceration, you know, people were being killed and their murderers weren't being held accountable. They were just being acquitted by juries who were saying, well, yeah, totally understandable why you would kill that deviant, to the referendum in 2015 when gay marriage was legalised in Ireland. And Cyril's life kind of rides those tides of history. He's in Dublin. He ends up leaving, going to Amsterdam, which was already quite liberal in the 1970s. He's then in New York in the 1980s for the AIDS epidemic before coming back to Dublin. And it's not a romp, It's kind of rollicking. The thing to say is that it is very funny. It's weird, right? Because obviously he lives through some very heartbreaking moments and it's just really traumatic. And he, this man, is never going to fully recover from what has happened to him. But at the same time, you get this really fast, sharp, witty, funny dialogue. Slightly odd occurrences, coincidences that you really only can allow for in a novel that is slightly you know, massaging reality, right? Mm. Like these things wouldn't happen in reality. They're taking you into a world where these things are made plausible. It would be a great book club book as well. It is chunky. It took me a while to read it. Mm. Sometimes that's really nice though, where you you really can immerse yourself in something. Yeah, it had been a while since I'd read such a proper novel. Mm. You know, when you're just kind of like, you sink into a world and into a cast of characters. Mm -hmm. Cyril himself is delightful. His relationships with his mother is amazing. From a very young age, he's kind of in love with his best friend, but never tells his best friend until the worst possible moment, which in itself is tragic, but also quite funny. Yeah, I'd be interested to read more John Boyne because I think he he probably bridges that commercial fiction literary divide. I can see why he would sell so well because his writing is very accessible. Mm, that sounds great. I think the younger you are, the more you forget about how people in your life will have lived in such different circumstances. Mm. You know, someone in their 80s, what would their life have been like if they were a gay man? You just, you just don't think about it. And actually, it's quite an obvious device once you start talking about it, but I hadn't read anything like that before. Mm, That sounds great. Continuing on the funny theme, I also, my other book club, my mum's book club, read Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons, which a few people in that book club had never read. This to me is such a familiar book. It's a 20th century classic. It was published in 1932 and Stella Gibbons was a journalist and she wrote this as a kind of riposte to this fashion at the time for bucolic countryside novels that were very overwrought, I think, often with slightly ridiculous dramatic storylines. One of the things that came up is that for us, it's slightly odd because we're not familiar with the genre of books that she's parodying. But arguably, it doesn't matter. For me, it certainly doesn't matter. But it's true that there were a couple of people in the book club who struggled with the style because it's written in this very slightly strange way. There's a funny little introduction that I hadn't ever read before. It's a letter from Stella Gibbons to someone called Anthony Pookworthy, 
who it turns out is a novelist who writes these kinds of novels that Cold Comfort Farm will go on to parody. And she writes to him explaining how much she loves these books that he writes and that she's decided to write one in kind of homage and that she's taken the liberty of marking up passages which she feels would be of particular interest and delight to him. And this explains why, as you read it, some passages have asterisks, three asterisks, really? two asterisks. I've read this book so many times and I never knew why the asterisks were there. And that was really funny because a lot of people in the book club have missed that too. And so we were like, oh, because when you don't know and you come across these asterisks, of course, you immediately start making all kinds of in- your own interpretations as to why, why, why are the asterisks there? Is she mocking him though? I mean, the thing she is, must that, be. As someone pointed out to me, of course, Pukworthy, I don't think he, he wasn't real. You oh, know, okay. She made all about, right. But you see, this brings me back to another thing where, you know, how kind of clever this book is. I should say for anyone who doesn't know it, the plot, Flora Post is, what is she? She's probably like 19, 20, 21, something like that. And she's orphaned, but that's fine because it's a comedy and we don't really know anything about her parents. And she's she's been at boarding school all her life, so she doesn't mind too much that they're not around anymore. But she doesn't inherit much from them except a legacy of £100 a year. And she doesn't feel that she can work. You know, her friend, Mrs. Smiling, says, well, Flora, you must learn to type and go and get a job. You know, you know you'll be bored if you just sit around and don't have anything to do. And we loved her horror at this suggestion. She's like, oh, my goodness, I couldn't possibly. And Mrs. Smiling says, well, Flora, what will you do? And she says, well, I will go and live on my relatives, of course. So she writes to all her relatives. She's got this £100 a year and she proposes to go and live with them, give them the £100. She will go and live with them and they will sort of look after her. And she gets these funny letters back from the various different people that she's written to. There's one aunt who runs a girls boarding school and is very sort of hearty and jolly hockey sticks and says, yes, yes, come and we will get lots of fresh air and get red cheek together or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and then there's a Scottish uncle who says that, yes, yes, what he wants is a wee girly to brighten his days. And, and, and they live out in the middle of nowhere and, and he worries it'll be a little bit boring for her. But, you know, she doesn't mind coming and, and keeping an old man coming. Says, no, no, no. And then she gets this letter from this farm and the envelope's dirty and there's a sort of thumbprint on it. It says, Dear niece, so you are after your rights at last. Well, I have expected to hear from Robert Post's child these last 20 years. Child, my man once did your father a great wrong. If you will come to us, I will do my best to atone, but you must never ask me what for. My lips are sealed. We are not like other folk, maybe, but there have always been stark adders at cold comfort, and we will do our best to welcome Robert Post's child. Child, child, if you come to this doomed house, what is to save you? Perhaps you may be able to help us when our hour comes. Your affectionate aunt, J. Starkadder. So she decides, of course, that these are the ones that she must go to. And she's got all these ideas about what it's going to be like. She says to her, Mrs. Smiling, oh my goodness, they're bound to be some oversexed farmhands called Seth and Reuben. And she's got all these ideas. And of course, when she goes there, it's exactly like that. It's just absolutely miserable and brilliantly so. Everything about it is terrible. There's this bull that's locked in a dark stable that bellows the whole time. Judith is miserable. Seth is the oversexed farmhand who is sort of men. Menacing. Amos is the patriarch who owns the farm. But he also goes off and preaches in the village. That's his real calling. He uh, goes and preaches to the quivering brethren and uh, frightens them with tales of hellfire and brimstone, that, that, you know, what's coming to them for all their wickedness. Reuben uh, is miserable because he really wants to run the farm, but he knows that Amos will never let him. There are various farm hands, And in the centre of it all is Aunt Ada Doom, who sits in her room. And the rumour is that she's mad. You know, she has them all in her thrall because she's mad. And the reason she's mad is because she saw something nasty in the woodshed when she was a wee little monnet. And this has affected her life. And, and she holds them all close. And into this goes bright, breezy Flora Post, who's completely horrified by the setup, but with great practicality and energy, starts tidying it up. And little by little, she starts to work her magic. It's hard to describe how funny it is. It's so sharp and the characters just leap off the page. What I loved about it, I was saying at Book Club, is I love that, you know, they do all have proper motivations, these characters. They're not just caricatures. They all do have thoughts and feelings and reasons why they are the way that they are. And I love that she bothered to take the trouble to put all that in there. And it's this kind of culture clash between these country folk and Flora with her sort of civilised London ways. There was a little bit about the character of Flora and how much we sort of like her. 
you know, whether you're supposed to like her. Some people found her quite annoying. I don't think we are supposed to like her 100%. I think she's being gently sent up in the way that they all are. You know, she herself is flawed in that she has a very specific ideas about how things should be and you know it's quite interfering you know she (laughs) wouldn't really let anyone just get on with things she wants to change everything but overall it's warm it's funny it's one of those books it's like a warm hug it's the sort of book you know in January February when it's dark and every time you turn on the news you just hear something so awful it makes you shrink inside and this is the book to offset all that it's just a book to curl up with and make you laugh This time around, reading it for me, I was deeply appreciative of the cleverness of it, which maybe when I was younger, it didn't strike me so much. Now I just think she's such a brilliant writer. And to do all this and for it to be a kind of parody of something else as well, you know, back in the day when people who were familiar with these other books that she's sort of referencing in in little subtle ways, must have had a whole other level of enjoyment from it that's lost on us now. But I've read it. And I didn't appreciate that it was also mocking contemporary novels. I very much picked up on its riffing off of Thomas Hardy Mm. and the fatalistic countryside Mm. where everything is tough and people have no choice and you must live your life and it will just be plodding and dark and the weather will be terrible. And I adored it too. I really like Stella Gibbons's style. I think because she wrote lots of other things and... uh... Have you read them? I've read one of her books. No, I've never read anything else by her. And this made me think, you know, it's ridiculous. I should read something else by her. I think she's so great. (laughs) You should read Westwood, which is her novel about the Hampstead Heath sort of cultural set. Because Stella Gibbons herself grew up in Kentish Town, where Mm. I lived. And I think I read her two books. Not She has more than that, but these two books when I was living in Kentish Town. Westwood is very different, a little bit dark, not so funny. I would say not so enjoyable, but as a portrait of kind of the literati and the cultural world of that time, great. North London hasn't changed that much. Yeah, no, that sounds great. I would like to read that. I was thinking because I didn't think it would be that good a book club book because I just thought, well, everyone's just going to love this so much. And what are people going to have to say about it? In fact, I hadn't realised it was going to be as divisive as it was in that there were some people who just didn't really click with it. They didn't really get the tone. And if you don't really like the main character that much and you don't really appreciate the humour, then I could see it would just be a bit tiresome, really. And I think they found that. But then what made for good discussion was that the others amongst us who had sort of had quite a different relationship with it and maybe had read it more than once, you know, at different stages of our lives. And it was just really, really interesting then almost having to sort of defend it slightly. And it ended up with us all sitting around reading out passages from it and just falling about laughing. It was let's, just let's read a passage, actually, because I've just flipped it open and already I'm like, oh, yes. Mr. Myberg was looking rather sulky and miserable because he had hoped to find Flora alone and have a lovely long scene with her, apologising for his behaviour last night and talking a lot about himself. He became more sulky at first on hearing Mr. Neck address Flora as sweetheart, but after listening to a little of their conversation, he decided that Mr. Neck was the sort of amusing type that calls everybody sweetheart and did not mind so much. Yeah, Mr. Mybug, who is a Hampstead intellectual, who uh, has ended up in Beershawn, the village which the farm is near, and immediately, of course, inevitably falls madly in love with Flora and is always wanting to go on long walks with her where he can talk about himself and talk about sex. (laughs) And she finds it very tiresome. (laughs) She doesn't ever want to listen to either of those things. She decides that she's going to start serving tea for the farmhands and get people to come in. You know, she realises that if she's going to make any changes, she does have to sort of start forming relationships with people. And so she decides the way to do this will be to institute tea in the afternoon. Of course, there were no preparations for tea in the kitchen. She realised as soon as she saw the ashy fire and the crumbs and fragments of carrot left on the table from dinner that it was rather optimistic of her to have expected any. But she was not daunted. She filled the kettle, put some wood on the fire and set the kettle onto it, flicked the remainders of dinner off the table with Adam's drying up towel, which she held in the tongs, and set out a ring of cups and saucers about the dinted pewter teapot. She found a loaf and some butter, but no jam, of course, or anything effeminate of that sort. Just as the kettle boiled and she darted forward to rescue it, a shadow darkened the door and there stood Reuben, looking at Flora's gallant preparation with an expression of stricken amazement mingled with fury. Hello, said Flora, getting her blow in first. I feel sure you must be Reuben. I'm Flora Post, your cousin, you know. How do you do? I'm so glad to see somebody has come down for some tea. Do sit down. Do you take milk? No sugar? Of course. Or do you? I do, but most of my friends don't. And then this is a triple-starred passage. The man's big body, etched menacingly against the bleak light that stabbed in from the low windows, did not move. His thoughts swirled like a beck in spate behind the sodden grey furrows of his face. A woman. Blast. 
blast. Come to rest away from him the land whose love fermented in his veins like slow yeast. She, woman, young, soft-coloured, insolent. His gaze was suddenly edged by a fleshy taint. Break her, break, keep and hold, hold fast the land. The land, the iron furrows of frosted earth under the rain lust. The fecund spears of rain, the swelling slow burst of seed sheaths. The slow smell of cows and cry of cows. The trampling bride path of the bull in his hour. All his, his. Will you have some bread and butter? asked Flora, handing him a cup of tea. Oh, never mind your boots. Adam can sweep up the mud afterwards. Do come in. Defeated, Reuben came in. He stood at the table facing Flora, blowing heavily on his tea and staring at her. Flora did not mind. It was quite interesting, like having tea with a rhinoceros. <laughs> Can't you just imagine Stella Gibbons writing this and giggling away to herself? Like yes. She has had such fun. Yes, I can. It feels like that. It just feels like she had a lot of fun writing it and you have a lot of fun reading it. And I think, I think the people... At book club who hadn't enjoyed it so much I almost feel like they were a bit persuaded by the end <laughs> I like to think anyway. they just hadn't read it right no no it wasn't that at all it was almost yeah it's like you have to kind of get the tone of it and then you can appreciate it but if you I could see I think they were just really baffled and then quite frustrated by it and you wouldn't enjoy it if you if you read it in that state of mind <laughs> So a good haul of book club books, really. The only one that is out of the running for sure is The Secret Commonwealth by Philip Pullman. But I'd highly recommend The Witch Elm for a book club as I would The Hearts Invisible Furies. And yes, mine were Love by Hannah Orstevic, which made for a great book club discussion. Uh, the Anna Karenina fix, as yet untested, but I feel sure it would be a good one. And Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons, which also was highly enjoyable. And maybe the perfect book club pick for February. Yeah, I'd save it for the dark winter months if you live in the dark in Northern <laughs> Europe. Yeah. <laughs> That's all for this episode. Have you just read something that would make for a brilliant book club read? What's the best thing your book club has ever read? What's the worst? Write in and let us know. We would love to hear about it. Drop us a line at thebookclubreview at gmail.com. On our next book club show, we'll be discussing Stories of Your Life and Others by Ted Chang. It's the latest book read by My Book Club and Chang's first collection of sci-fi short stories, including the inspiration for the film Arrival, starring Amy Adams. But did it make for a good discussion? Listen in to find out. I'm so excited for that show because we're going to be joined by rocket scientists. Real rocket scientists. Yeah. And if you missed it, do check out our special episode on a subject close to our hearts, how to start and run a flourishing book club. It's packed full of inspiration. So whether you're interested in discussing your books out in the fresh air, like the Walking Book Club of Hampstead Heath, tackling a literary masterpiece like the Proust Book Club of Paris, or celebrating your love of a beloved author like the Chili Cooper Book Club, listen in to hear all about it. Finally, if you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, or on Twitter at Book Club Review Pod, that's RVW Pod. Or you can email us at thebookclubreview at gmail.com. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what we do, please do take a moment to rate, review and subscribe to us on iTunes. It helps other listeners find us and means you'll never miss an episode. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. 